Welcome to the Riot Podcast, where we have practical discussions on how to share your faith, see the news from God's eyes, and answer some of faith's hardest questions. Welcome to the Riot Podcast. This is Bob Shoneman alongside Pete Robertson. How are you doing, Pete? Hello, hello, hello. It's so good to do the show with you again today. I know, I'm not Mac Daddy today. I'm just Pete Robertson. Hey, if you guys hear any loud crashing and banging, it's not our executive producer throwing things at Pete. We are having an incredible lightning storm right now, and it is it is loud. Christine jumped out of her seat, I think. Yeah, she was saying, she was, did you feel the, like, <laughs> did you feel the buzz? I mean, it was so loud that we were in praying, and as we were praying, all of a sudden, we're like, what? Uh, what did I just say? I mean, it really. Yeah, Pete was praying like, Lord, give me a sign <laughs> like that. <laughs> and now you should see his hair. It's standing up. It looks sharp. I just got it cut. <laughs> I needed to get it cut. I, I tell you people all the time as I talk about my hair a lot, but man, I tell you, I got some serious Elvis Presley waves going on. You so when do. It gets, when it goes, it goes. If, if they, if they make, you know, the Elvis show part two, they could, you could star in that. Like if I got some serious. Like the older Elvis. Oh like yeah. If the Elvis older. was still alive today. Oh, yeah, yeah, the older. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much. much. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. Elvis has left the building. Oh, mercy. And Have what's you, going on in your life, Pete? Um, A lot. I just, uh, let's see, last week we celebrated my wife's birthday and our anniversary. That was fun. Right. Your your 30th anniversary and her 46th birthday. Yep. Yep. No, 39th. (laughs) 39th birthday. Wait, you got married when she was nine? Oh, wait. I was saying, I was going with 16 trying to keep it okay. Oh, you're right. That does give it away, doesn't (laughs) it? I was trying to help you out. Yeah, that's the truth. She's really only 39. He married yeah. her when she was nine years old. Yeah, that would be like biblical proportions. Uh, Didn't that happened back then. Like I 12 years old. I hope I think, not. I, think I hope so. not. I think they were, people were married at 12, 13. I think so. Why? Oh, they just married them off young. I mean, because they needed the goats. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, they needed goats. <laughs> <laughs> you trade, trade for goats. They needed oh, something, man, that's but yeah, so cool. that was fun. That was exciting. That's not cool. So awesome. Yeah. Th- and then this week, this week you're going to be in, you're in Tahoe. Well, the show drops what July 20th. Yep, you'll be at Tahoe. I will be in Reno today, probably Tahoe tomorrow. So uh-huh. bowling the national tournament with my beautiful wife, Crystal, yeah. shout out beautiful wife, Crystal. Yeah. And uh, so that's fun. We get to do this <laughs> once a year. You're only allowed to bowl at one time. You get nine games. That's it. Boom. You're done for the year. So what do you like best about Tahoe? Um, I that's mean, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, best. Have you ever been there during the ski t- season? No, yeah, no. I I get pictures from Mount Rose. <laughs> I don't know. I'm on some mailing list. Mm-hmm. So when they get their snow, but the, the amount of snow they get there, sometimes it's, it's un- enormous. It's, it's yeah. funny when you're driving from Reno to Tahoe. They had these. If you've never been there, they had these poles on the side of the road that go like 20 feet in the air. Then I asked, them, like, what are those for? It's the. It's so people. The snow plows no. know where the road is. Yeah. Like that's how much snow oh, yeah. they get. Yeah. We <laughs> it's had a, insane. We had a friend that lived there. Um, Steve and Lonnie, shout out to you, Lonnie, if you're listening. Um, she would, they would open up the front door and literally there would be so much snow they can't get out. <laughs> so they would have to, they have a shovel inside. They would have to like yeah. shovel a hole through yeah. the snow just to get out. Yeah. The they front. measure the snow in feet to not yeah. inches there. Yeah. It, it's yeah. crazy. But one of the most beautiful places on the planet. So I am really looking forward to, um, well, if you're listening to the show on the drop day tomorrow, going to Tahoe. So we let, it's, it's just an incredible place. So Reno is kind of desert yeah, and 40 minutes away and old and, and old. Yeah. yeah and and outdated. So you drive 40 minutes up the incline, a little town called incline village and the climate completely changes. It goes from desert, dry, arid to this beautiful green, lush forest. And then Lake Tahoe is just stunning. Yeah, it's crystal clear. It's hundreds of feet deep, maybe thousands. I don't know. It's it's really deep, but so crystal clear. It's like being in the Caribbean, yeah. but you're up in the mountains. Yeah, and Lake Tahoe is is a very deep lake. Very deep. Yeah, there's a lot so of. Water I think that's got something to do with the, the the color of it and the way mm-hmm. the light shines. It's just stunning, absolutely stunning. And you got redwood trees, especially on the California side. You drive around the California side, you yeah. have lots of places to go hiking. Not the there's very very big falls. ones, but there's. Some pretty good yeah, size ones there. Pretty big. Yeah. So it's just a beautiful place. Yeah. Some is not not too far from there. So we're doing that, and then uh, we're going to go to Yosemite. So I'll I'll talk about that. We do shows when we get back. I'll, yeah. I'll share kind of our experience. But uh, Crystal and Sammy have never been to Yosemite, so that's going to be cool. Mm-hmm. It's a long drive. I didn't realize it was five hours. 
Hmm. Like it's only like 150 miles away. It's a little further. There's no easy way to get there. No, but it'll be a beautiful drive. No, no. it'll be a long day. I'm going to get up early in the morning drive because we're doing all out and backs from Reno. The hotel was I, so much. Cheaper. If there's uh, there's certain national parks, I mean, there's so many beautiful national parks in the United States. I there's a lot that are in 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 Utah that yes. I highly recommend. Zion yep. National Park, Bryce Canyon. But I'm telling you, out out west, uh, Yosemite and Sequoia National Park are, and then also the Redwoods, but National Park. But those are like you have there's least stunning. ones. Yep. And if you're a, if you're a hiker, I don't know how you not get out there. I mean, because the trails there and the beauty there is just absolutely incredible. But uh, yeah, I remember we used to take um, we used to take uh, when I was a high school pastor, a youth, youth pastor. I should say, we used to take our kids up and we did our own camps and we would stay at this place called Lodgepole and it was tenting in the Sequoias. And we would stay right on the river there. And um, it was just absolutely incredible bears all around. And we would be camping with the bears. And I remember one time we got up really early and, and I saw one of the bears sniffing at one of the campers feet and he was sitting there and he was sniffing his feet or the tent. Checking and, them out, huh? And we would always hang our food way up high in the mountain in the, in the, we put them in a sack and we would hang it high up inside. So they don't trees. get it. It was a lot of fun though. That was, I mean, there's just so much beauty. I can't tell you. I mean, hikes, we through and down there. And, it's stunning. Yeah. God, God was showing off when he built Yosemite Valley. Yeah. I think I'm going to free climb uh, El Capitan. What do you think? No, you're not. And this no would, way. this would be my last show yeah. if I were to do that. No. I mean, they have, I've been, I've been close to it, but they have like, smaller areas where you can climb or help i mean if they still do i don't know ben but they have like like for amateurs where you can actually hook in and go up a small part yeah no it's way not, not wise no you got to be experienced to do that man <laughs> i wouldn't get insane. 10 feet i wouldn't get 10 feet no worries yeah. even if i fall i'll be okay because I mean, i'm like not gonna get the, high enough you need the bunny hill like, the bunny. <laughs> no <laughs> doubt no doubt so we're, we got that to look forward to that's going to be amazing yeah can't yeah. wait yeah, so we're going to jump back into the book of John. Yep. You so know? last week we did John 18 and we finished in, I believe, verse 19, verse 16. So that, today that sounds right. Yeah. Yep. So today we're going to pick up verses 17 through 42 of John 19. What do we call in today's show? Um, I, why Jesus' death matters. And so, I mean, I think a lot of people, the list of, oh, I know why Jesus' death matters. But I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's there's a little bit more depth to that. So today we're just going to kind of uncover it, you know, to see it pick up from last week go into it right. can't wait it's gonna be fun all right, all right. Well, let's pray? Open up and pray yeah, yeah. Prayer. lord we thank you for the just the opportunity to share your word today with our listeners as we dive back into the book of john lord and talk about and read about um yeah, this just unbelievable love that you have for us that you sent jesus to die on a cross for us and we're gonna just read the story and kind of hopefully it comes alive in our um in our listeners minds as they as they hear uh from from what john has written his his recollection his recollection and uh lord man just though just would you just use this in a mighty way today would you bless the show father would you uh help pete and i just speak uh words of truth lord that any of our comments and our analysis of of this text that that it be uh just brings you glory Oh. The Father, we just love you. We thank you. We give you the show now in Jesus' name. Amen. It was so funny as you and you said bring bring you glory. I was thinking the exact same thing. It really? was just weird. Yeah, I was just thinking bring when you were because you were like like I don't know like there was a like a space in between your word or a something hesitation. Yeah, yeah. So and I said bring you glory, and then you said I was like whoa. I I think I even actually made a verbal like ah. <laughs> that was kind of funny. Uh -oh. That's right. cool. So sometimes I hesitate. Wait, yeah. wait isn't that like uh, James buy you a Coke or something? Is that what you're supposed to do when you say something at the same time? Um, oh. I have no idea what you're talking about. You never heard that before? No. Like if like if we said this, ah, oh, Jinx, buy me a oh, Coke. Oh, Jinx. I never heard the buy me a Coke part. Oh, uh, what did you over here? Is yeah. there something else? Just Jinx, and then you can't speak or something. Oh, you can't? Yeah. I, I like know. the buy me a Coke part better. I have literally or, or never Sprit heard that. Or Sprite or Sprite or wherever else, Pepsi. Pop. Oh, pop. Depending on where you live Soda in the pop. country. Yeah. A Dr. Pepper. Yeah. We were at, we were hanging out with our, my, my, my brother-in-law and he's like, yeah, we're going to pick up some soda pop. And I was like, wait, what? We're going to pick up what? Squirrel. Yeah. From Chicago. <laughs> wait, we're talking about Jesus death. Why Jesus doesn't matter. Let's get back on topic. Come on now. Uh, all right. Today we will unpack Jesus's final hours left on earth. The apostles creed states it, it without embellishment. 
He was crucified, dead, and buried. These three events are all described in our reading today of John 19, verses 17 through 42. This unbelievable event needs to be understood from the historical point of view as well as the doctrinal point of view. We will cover them both today and ask questions. Why is what happened so important, and why did it have to happen? Yeah, that's good. So let's read. You want to read the Apostles' Creed real quick? Or you want me to? You'd read it. Okay. So um, what I when, when we um, planted a church a while back, Christine and I, we called our church Creed Church. And many people, well, why did you call it Creed Church? Well, this is the reason why we called it Creed Church. I thought it was because you liked the band Creed. Or, or Apollo Creed from Rocky. Or Apollo Creed. <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't, it wasn't either one of those. This is the reason why. So here, let me read what the, the Apostles' Creed is. And it's not because the Apostles wrote it. It's just, it's, it's based off of a, a creed that all the top theologians and all the minds of them have got together says, what do we believe? You know, we kind of talked about Declaration of Independence. It's like, after that was written, everybody was able to get behind it. There was passion behind it. There was purpose behind it. Once this was written, everybody was able to get behind it and say, yes, this is what we believe in. Why so we this was it. written by brilliant theologians? Yeah, just they got together and now there's a purpose. So here, let me read it to you. So Apostle Creed, a lot of people have never heard the Apostle Creed. So here it is. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Catholic Church. Catholic means Christian, Holy Christian Church. The communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the ever, life everlasting. Amen. That is the Apostle Creed. So if you want to know the doctrine that we live by and what we believe and why we believe, there it is. So that is the full doctrine. of. I don't think I've heard that read in a while. It's been, it's been a while. Yeah, pretty good, huh? Yeah. All right. All right. Let's, let's jump into John. Uh, John 19. Yep, Verses 17, 17 through 27. Let's start there. ESV. All right. I'm going to read the last four words of verse 16. Okay. So they took Jesus, comma, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which is which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Golgotha? Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. John's really trying to draw the picture there. Yes, he is. You really yeah. understand what's going on. I love it. It's kind of redundant there, but uh, I guess he really wants to make sure we got it. Yep. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So in three different languages. Yep. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather write, this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says, they divided my garden, my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. You know why I emphasize woman like that? Why? It's the same word that Jesus uses in John 2. Yep. When he calls woman. You know, people yep. are like, oh, that was disrespectful. Yeah. Well, it's not, obviously, because no. he, he uses this uses the same word. I call my know. wife woman. Woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you're not Jesus. No, but I do it in a respectful <laughs> way, woman woman let's go she's a woman i mean i can't deny that all right let's all right. jump into this pilot delivered jesus to wait the... is that a whole different separate show talking about woman, woman? and a woman yeah maybe oh, yeah how do you define never mind that's squirrel cool. that's going pilot <laughs> delivered jesus to the chief priests and they with the help of the roman soldiers took jesus to be crucified 
a Roman philosopher said it was the most cruel and shameful of all punishments. I can only imagine. It's so funny when we say, you know, we're saying a Roman philosopher. Well, it's like the history that Rome has. Rome has a lot of history. I mean, they've they've documented a lot of history. And so we can, you know, take it. So people, minute they hear that, oh, it's from a Roman philosopher, it's from, you know, a, a, a Roman historian or whatever. It's like immediately, like, oh, yeah, that's true. But we say that, you know, some biblical scholar yeah. or a biblical whatever, they're like, oh, no, that can't be true. Yeah, that's such your whatever. source outside of the Bible. There's <laughs> more there's more historical documentation from the Bible than anything of Rome. And so it's I mean, don't take our word for it. Look it up for yourself. Yeah. I'm not just saying that we have more. We have more translations and more everything from the Bible than we or do from that. Trans- or, yeah, from yeah that more, more evidence. Yeah. So everything we can now, for us, we read what the Bible says and what we just read about Jesus's uh, death here or getting to that part is we can believe it. So that that's how I think of that. Well, anyway, so let's go into this. So, you know, Pilate delivered Jesus, the chief priest and, and so on. And so it's been said that the crucifixion probably got its origins from the Persians or Phoenicians. So when you look back in time, says, well, did the Romans invent it? No, I don't think they did. So there you go. So They perfected it, huh? They perfected it, but if it was the Romans who made special use of it, I mean, they they made it a you know a big spectacle. I mean, I've read um, old stories of you be walking down a road, then all of a sudden you see these uh, crosses just lining the road, you know, and so and people would be sitting on there, um, so they would use it as a spectacle for sure. Uh, but this mode of, mode of capital punishment was reserved for the lowest kind of criminals, particularly those who promoted insurrection. For us, Christians, the cross is a symbol of the glory and the victory. But in Pilate's day, the cross stood for the basis kind of rejection, shame, and suffering. It was Jesus who made the difference. And so, yeah, I mean, just like time, right? AD, BC. Yeah. I mean, Jesus Jesus changed everything. And uh, and so he took the cross. He says, no, this is going to be, this is something that I'm going to make a big deal, you know? But the world's like, oh, that's shame, rejection. But not for Jesus. It was... Yeah. It was a part of the whole big story, you know, a part of his story. So, exciting. All right. During Roman times, it was required for the criminal to wear a placard announcing their crime. Pilate wrote Jesus' crime. This is Jesus <laughs> of Nazareth, funny. the king of the Jews. The chief, priest, the chief priest protested the title. I bet he did. But Pilate refused. To change it that just cracks me up so he so here it is you know they have to announce their crime they're going to say exactly what they did right so Thief, why whatever you know. right why is this criminal hanging here oh he murdered somebody he yep. tried to start an insurrection right he's king of the jews so in Pilate's <laughs> mind he believed yeah that he he believed that jesus believed that he was jesus of nazareth the king of the jews he believed it yep and the reason why he's dying is because all of these other people did not believe that he was the king of the Jews. And it's like it was a prophetic and he had no idea. He probably thought it was a funny, but we're going to talk about what Pilate was thinking most likely. This was Pilate means at getting back at the Jewish establishment. He knew that the priests and the elders envied Jesus and wanted to destroy him. Pilate was a shrewd politician and understood the workings of the Jewish religious establishment. He knew that placard would both insult and embarrass them. And that is exactly what he wanted. Oh, yeah. He's definitely poking. He's poking fun at the Jewish leaders. There's Not no doubt. fun, but he's like, it's like there's an open wound there and he's pouring salt into it. And w- without him knowing it, he was proclaiming the truth. Without him it's knowing true. I mean, here's Jesus. Remember in our last episode, what is truth, right? What is truth? Well, Pilate, guess what? You just declared the truth right there without <laughs> even knowing it. That is true. Yeah, righteous invasion of truth. That's it. All right. The fact that the title was written in in Hebrew or Aramaic, yeah. Greek and Latin is significant, right? Why is that? Well, it is. I mean, for one thing, it shows that Jesus was crucified in a place where people and nations met. So you're when you put it up there, it's like you're going to have people the Aramaics, you're going to have your Jews, you're going to have you know Latin speakers, you're going to have all these different languages, and so. You know, you want everybody to know what it is. So they're all looking up going, okay, I could read that. That says Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. So the king, they're executing the king today? I don't know. Do you think that was that was normal? So for a, oh, murder, yeah. for a murderer, would they have written murder yes. in three yes. different languages? Yeah. Uh, yes. I think the reason why it was so big, you got to remember, this was during Passover. So there is a huge influx Uh-oh. of people there. All the hotels. All, are full. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> all the there, airbnbs yeah, they're all yes yeah. so there's a lot of people there jesus didn't just get crucified in any other day this is the biggest day this is where everybody comes in so that's maybe it, it might not have been in it that was the super bowl of jewish holidays yeah so they did a little bit more on that day so these criminals probably were a big deal I mean, it's during that time. I don't know. Maybe they, I don't know. I'm not going to read into it, but yeah. But Greek was the language of the philosophers and Latin was the language of the law. So Romans, you know, they spoke Latin and had that. All three combined uh, to crucify Jesus. So all of the religion, all of the cultures, all of the languages, everything combined to crucify Jesus at that moment. But Jesus did not die for just all, th for these three parties. He died for the whole world. So, yeah, these three were the major dominated, dominating languages during that time. And so Jesus was dying there, but he was saying, -uh, I'm doing this for everybody. I'm taking back the kings of the kingdom. I'm taking the title deed to the world. And because of what I'm doing now, every person everywhere can come to know who I am. So, yes, I am the king of Nazareth, but I'm not just the king of the Jews, king of the world. Yeah, and along those same lines, John, in, in this gospel, he emphasizes the worldwide dimensions of the work of Christ. Yeah. Without even realizing it, Pilate wrote a gospel track when he prepared the title. <laughs> we know this because one of the thieves on the cross discovered Jesus was a king and asked entrance into his kingdom. I'm thinking, did he know? You know, you always want to know. Did he know that he was this before? Maybe because remember before they were all crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna the week before, right? You know, and so they, they kind of thought he was a Messiah, but did this guy know? Maybe not. He might've been in jail. He might've been away from all of that. And so maybe he's sitting there looking up at yeah, this placard yeah. Yeah. and he's saying that King of the Jews, you're the King of the Jews. And then he probably heard or maybe Jesus spoke. We don't know. Maybe there was other things that were said. All we know is that this guy immediately was convicted in his heart. And he knew immediately that this guy was innocent, something innocent about this. guy. And he's like, you know, I, I believe you. I 100% believe that you are the king of the Jews <clears throat> and you are who you say you are. So we know that Hebrews 13, 11 through 13 says that Jesus was crucified outside the city between two other victims. But we do not know exactly where Jesus' cross stood. So a lot of people have him in the center, right? And then two thieves on both sides. It doesn't actually say that, so we don't know that for sure. So let's clarify that real quick. Um, there has been so many uh, topography changes. In wait, 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 back up. Yeah. I thought John was very clear. What does it say? Let's go back to verse, uh, da, 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 sorry, 18. There they crucified, crucified him with two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. John's very clear, I think. So you're saying that, that he's in the middle for sure. He's in the middle for sure. I think John makes that very clear. So if, to me, anyway. Could he been could he been on one side, two on either side, or both sides? Could that have been a circle? Could he have been on one side and then maybe they were in a circle? Oh, I don't know. That's what I'm saying. They that's what I'm getting at. Okay. I yeah. got you. Okay. Yeah. I was confused. Because we automatically just say they're straight across. Uh oh. Yeah. Could it have been like a circle? Like could a semicircle or something. Could it have been different? Could still would have been between them. It, that's what I'm saying, though. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I'm glad you mentioned that so we can clarify it. But the point of it is, we just don't know. Because we also see reports of them in circles around. So we don't know if it was straight across. How, was it at an angle? Was it, what? How was it? We don't so know. they could look at each other's suffering? We don't know. Yeah. yeah. So I think they were able to see each other, is my thought. So... If they were by, side by side, they're not looking at each other, right, left. It might be a little bit harder. But if they were in a circle sphere or something, now they're looking straight across from each other. Maybe they could talk or Man, maybe everybody's Easter, Easter decorations have got to be changed now. We're not trying to do that. We're just saying we don't want to assume. That's, all, that's <laughs> the only thing that we're doing in here is just saying let's just not assume. Okay, so that's it. But we also don't know exactly where the location was. So because of the topography changes in Jerusalem since AD 70, that it's impossible to determine accurately either the route Jesus took or even where the cross stood. On tours to Israel, pilgrims are shown the Holy Sepulcher and the Gordon Calvary, uh, which is near the Garden Tomb. Both places are guesses. And I know I don't want to like take air out of people's you know, thing, but we, we think that's the area. It's most likely the area. Um, because you look around, you don't really see really any other locations, but we don't know what's been destroyed. We don't know what's not been destroyed. We don't know what's been built over. 
um, there's some things that could not, you know, could mess that up. So to say that, yes, that's, that's the garden tomb for sure. Yeah. That would be not right. Does it, yeah. Yeah. Does it really matter that we know the exact? No, it doesn't. Location? No, it doesn't. But we're just, we're just sharing truth, but we can confirm based on scripture. It took place. We do know that. We do know that Pilate, without knowing it, declared God's truth and the criminal was forgiven of his sins and entered heaven with Jesus when he, that's the bottom line. Good. So we're, we're showing the other side just to create the discussion, just to get it out there. So people know. Get you, you talking know. about it. Yeah. It's just, it's like, it's not that big of a deal. No. It does not affect our salvation, but the bottom line is what is the truth here? The truth is Pilate, without knowing it, declared God's truth and a criminal was forgiven of his sins and entered heaven with Jesus when that is the truth. That is the most important topic. Don't get caught up in the small things. I think that's the, that's where we're going. Good. You know, don't get caught up in all this whatever. So that's he took out there. the tour yeah. in Jerusalem, and yeah. you're like, I, I've seen where he was crucified. Yes, that's fine. Yes, keep, you keep believing that. Yes, just know that it may have been a you know you, you it, may be off by a couple of feet. It or, might be or my, a football field or, or somewhere. But, yes, but the idea is what happened there and what and is what it about? Is, that's yep. right. Yeah. All right. I think the fact that Jesus was crucified with two notorious thieves only added to the shame. But more than anything else, it fulfilled the prophecy written in Isaiah 53, 12. He was numbered with the transgressors. He was treated like a common criminal. God, I just, again, here's this. So much prophecy fulfilled. It is. It's and crazy. It, and they were, and he's a, he's li he lived a holy, perfect life. And here he is a criminal, right? It's just, it blows my mind. It's like, you know, we, because people didn't like us or because we lived, a, because we were nice or because we did something, you know, whatever. Like, oh, no, that person needs to be put to death. I mean, that's, that's kind of what it is. But everything about what happened to Jesus was foretold in scripture. We must understand that. Not only in Isaiah 53, but in Psalms 22, 16 through 18, where the four men took a piece of clothing, Psalms 34, 20, Zechariah 12, 10. Modern day executions are usually carried out in private, but Jesus was nailed to a cross and hung up for everyone to see. It was outside where 3,000 plus visitors were there for Passover. During that time, it was natural for people to gather and watch. Can you imagine just being in front of everybody? I mean, like we have our electric chair or our, or our capital punch. We should do a show on that. Um, where the injections and some people come to witness it to make sure that they're dead. Um, I guess back in the... 80, 1800s or whatever they did hangings right so was that was spectacle yeah so, so they do it like in the, it? in the city square and yeah. people would come out yeah reminds me i was watching hunger games you know the movie and they kind of you know they know oh, that yeah, yeah it's like everybody it was like entertainment yeah so back in you know 30 a.d they yeah. didn't have YouTube or YouTube videos to watch or yeah. television. Yeah. They, they came out and watched the execution. Yeah, and then they yeah, also did, they did when, when the guns came about, remember they would walk, they would do 20 paces and turn around and shoot each other. That was another thing that they used to do, a spectacle. Um, oh, duels? Yeah, duels. Yeah. What, it, what John Adams or some other ones? Hamilton. Hamilton. And yeah. Burr. Hamilton yeah. and, and Burr. Burr. Yeah. yeah. So I'm sure, but that's, that's then, that's not now, but still, everybody was watching Jesus. But this, the bottom line in all this is, there's prophecy that was taking place. All of this was foretold in scripture. So this isn't like, oh, whatever. No, Jesus said, no, this is what I'm going to be doing. And when I do it, then you're going to believe. And that's what Paul said. The mysteries of Christ was revealed mm. to him. All of this was happening. And that's when Peter, after in Acts 2, when he started talking to Pentecost, is like, oh my gosh, all of this wasn't revealed before. But now let me share that this was all foretold before. And so that just gave them ammo to be able to share this Good with point. passion. That all of this was prophesied. And Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus told everybody what he was going to do. You know, I, I heard a, had a skeptic tell me one time, he's like, your, your whole religion is based on a bad weekend. Yeah. I mean, how, how gross is that, right? Yeah. And what they don't realize, like, but no, Jesus said he was going to die and he rose a dead. My religion is not based on a bad weekend. It's based on a, a God who loves me, who, who died and rose again from the and said he was going to do it and then rose again from the dead. It's an it's an ignorant statement it is. from somebody that's not willing to search deep within themselves. Good point. And they're just they're not willing to actually meditate on the the actual truth and the facts that are out there to actually take it in and let it and reason with it. Now, if you did that and you actually did the homework and then you still rejected it that's your choice. But that kind of response is somebody that has not done the homework. Yeah. That has not. Thanks for being not, clever. Does yeah. not understand. No. All right. Next statement. Yeah. 
A group of women, women, along with the Apostle John, stood near the cross. John specifies four women. Mary, the mother of Jesus. His, that's the same person. Mary, the mother of Jesus. <laughs> his mother's sister. Uh, Salome. How do you say that? I, I think Salome? So. I think so. It's like Salome? Yeah. Salome? Yeah. Maybe she was Italian. Yeah. The mother of James. And, and then, John. And John. Yep. And Mary, the wife of Clopas. Did I say that right? Clopas? Yep. yep. And then Mary Magdalene. Yep. So there's four four different women. And then, of course, John was there. Yep. This had to take courage for them to stand there and take the hatred being spewed out by the crowd to them and, more importantly, to Jesus. Yeah, because I'm sure that somebody recognized Mary, you know, his mom or one of the disciples, John yeah. or Mary Mag, because they were around him all the time. So, I mean, so it's <laughs> courage to be there, too. Yeah, I'm just, I mean, it would be hard. I mean, look at Peter, you know, what happened with him? You know, here he is in the, in the area trying to stay warm and hanging out outside and he gets recognized and he's like losing his marbles. Yeah. So this has got to be even worse. I mean, this is him being, oh, you sinners, you guys are horrible, you know, and all that stuff that's going on. And they're just like, man, he hasn't done anything wrong, but we're here taking it and he's naked in front of them. And it's just, it's got to be horrible. But the first time we meet Mary, Jesus' mother was when she was attending a wedding. Remember that? We talked about it in John. Now she is preparing for a burial. Nothing is recorded of Mary saying anything. She could have said her son was innocent, but she didn't. She remained, remained silent. She knew the deity of Christ, and she knew this day was coming. I, there's, you know, it was prophesied to her when he was a kid, right? So she's like, she had to probably like, what? You know, but I'm sure there was. I mean, you know, when Jesus says, you know, do this, you know, when he was doing the water and the wine and all that, there was this, she knew that, okay, this, this she kid knows is, more than anybody. Yeah. So I she mean, knew. Yeah. She, she knows she's carrying a child and had never had sex. Yep. So yep. She, yeah. She, the super, she's more aware than anybody. So the supernatural is heavy here, right? So Mary's not saying anything. So she knew the deity of Christ and she knew that this day was coming. I'm not sure she understood the total grand grand picture of it, that he was there to save the whole world. Mm. She knew it had something to do with it. Um, but she was there also at Pentecost, right? So she was there. She saw the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. She saw all this stuff starting to take place. And I can imagine this the, the excitement that came from her. Um, so I don't know. She knew the deity of Christ that was coming. She, Jesus assured her of his love, and he gave his choice's disciple, whom he loved. We know that because John tells us that. Over and over. Yes. <laughs> to be her adopted son and to care for her. We do know that John cared for her and that, he, and that she was among the believers in the upper room as, as a way to the Pentecost, I just said. And what an honor it would have been for John to take the place as the son of Jesus. I mean, just think about that. What a responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. We do know that she ended up in Ephesus. Um, you can go to a place in Ephesus or Kusadasi um, to actually see where they think they lived. Um, and so a lot of people go there. It's right outside of Ephesus. It's um, in between the town and the, and the ocean. But I mean, that's Ephesus is where John hung out as well. So after Patmos, he went back to Ephesus. And so Ephesus was the major, major play. Uh, during that time for a lot of a lot of this John's Gospels and stuff outside of Revelation. All right. All right, let's continue reading. Um, right. Verses 28 and 30. through 30. Yep. yep. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So Jesus knew what was going on. He was fully in control as he obeyed the Father's will. He had refused to drink the pain deadening wine that was offered to him. Um, well, while we, we know that because of Scripture, and we know that from context. So they they would usually give like a numbing agent or something to help with all the pain that you're going through. Sour wine was the I mean the, the what we just read was to help his thirst. So they would rub it around his lips and stuff. Um, so a lot of people, well, how do you know that? Well, there's a lot of research in on this, that there was a, there was a, there was a wine or a drink that helped deaden some of the pain that they were going through about crucifixion. Hmm. That's through history. That's how we know that. All right, go on. Okay. And then uh, 
this was all done to fulfill the scripture, um, the prophecy in scripture in Psalm 69, 21, where it says, I thirst. Yeah, that's just another one. I mean, we're going to be doing that throughout this whole show. There's just prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. Um, there's no doubt Jesus was enduring real physical suffering, for he had a real human body. He had just emerged from three hours of darkness when he felt the wrath of God and separation from God. When you combine darkness, thirst, and isolation, you have hell. <laughs> hmm. There were physical reasons for his thirst. Psalms 22, 15 says, my strength is dried up like a postured, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you have brought me into the dust of death. But there were also spiritual reasons, as it says in Psalms 42, 1 through 10, as a deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O God. So just imagine you are you are in a place where God is turning his back on you. There's wrath upon you right now. There is no love for God. There's nothing. There is absolute hatred towards you. And and you're sitting there going, I thirst for your goodness. I pant as a as a as a deer pants for bro for the water. And and so there's two parts there. One, he was actually physically thirsting. And the other part was he was he was spiritually thirsty because he felt the rejection of God. All of the sin of the world was put on his chest, on his shoulders. He was carrying it all. He died for our salvation. He died so that we can have eternal life. When God, after Jesus rose from the grave, we've said this on the show before, he looked at Jesus and he saw, um, he saw the sin. But when he looked at us, he saw Jesus. Mm. And uh, so that was the big difference. That was the transformation. That was what was taking place. But Jesus at that very moment was saying, dear pants for the water brook, so pants for my soul for you. God was like, he's like, God, please, mm. I thirst for you. All right. Something just hit me. Maybe you can, I don't know if this is accurate or not, so hopefully you can help me. That hiss a branch. It says they used to hiss a branch to lift it up to, isn't that what they <laughs> used at the first Passover? Yeah. To put the blood on the, on the door frame? Yeah. So they had some sort of branch and probably the hyssop branch where they, they did the blood. Yeah, there's a lot of parallels there. We should do a show actually on those parallels. That would be a really good show. That'd be cool. Because there's a ton of parallels between that. And it happened on Passover and then what's the whole point of Passover yeah. and all of that. I don't know. That just a, popped into my head. I'm yeah. like, ooh, that's yeah. a parallel there. Yeah. All right. Jesus made seven statements while he was on the cross. They are known as the seven words from the cross. His first few were his thoughts about others, those who were crucified with him. Uh, see Luke 23, 34, the believing thief and his mother. The next couple were his words to the father and their relationship. And the last three were statements focused on himself, his body, his soul, and his spirit. Yeah, I mean, so everyone always asks, what were their final words, right? Well, we get them here in scripture, and because they were from Jesus, they say a lot to us. So a lot of people, what did he say to you before he passed away, right? Or what is, what is it? Yeah. Well, Jesus gives us, you know, a, a, a full everything of what he was thinking what he was saying first thing is you know he's always thinking about others here he is dying and he's still thinking about others um he's you know he, Allah, Allah, Allah sabat to me my god my god why have you forsaken me so he's talking about you know god's forsaken him he's thirsting he's panting you know he's thinking about his body how it feels and it's you know the end of time you know so these are all the things that are taking place um during that time so uh, but the most important statement was his very last. It is finished. The Greek word there is telestai. It means it is finished, it, it stands finished, and it always will be finished. Jesus' death fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies of the coming Messiah, and the once and for all sacrifice for sin had now been completed. So out of everything that he said, it is finished. Hmm. And he gave his spirit up, and he died. Now. Another, another weird question. Can yeah. I ask a weird question? Yeah, I love it. Did he... So John wrote to, tel, to Telestai, however you say it. Yeah. Did Jesus say it in Greek, or is, he, is John just translating it because he's writing the book in Greek? He was probably... Because I see the quotation marks. I'm like, did Jesus say it in Greek, or he, he would have said it in Aramaic, I would think, right? I, we don't know. I mean, it's, he would... The common language probably for the daily people were Greek. There were a lot of Greek you know, the Hellenistics, the Greek um, in Jerusalem, probably didn't speak too much Latin because that was more Roman. Um, and then, um, but no, it was probably Greek because now let's just think about it. So the, the Pharisees and Sadducees were using the Septuagint only, which was the Greek translation of the Torah from the Hebrew. 
that was only in play at that time. Um, so they were speaking probably Greek. Okay. Yeah. I don't yeah. know why. If you start working it weird, out. Weird questions yeah. that I ask, the yeah. way my brain works. Yeah. All right. Some unbelievers have, in, have invented the idea that Jesus did not really die, that he was, he was only swooned on the cross and then revived in the cool of the tomb. But there are too many witnesses that confirm Jesus actually died. Centurion, all the gospel writers, angels, the Jews, and Christ himself. Of course, Paul, Peter, and John mentioned the death of Christ in their letters. This kid goes back again what we said before. We have so much document proof that everything that is said in the Bible has come true. It is fact. We cannot deny it. There's so many eyewitnesses. I mean, just when Jesus' resurrection alone, it's not a coincidence that the Bible says that 500 people saw him at once, over 500 people. So it's, it's like Jesus was making, it's like, I don't, it's for anybody to deny that Jesus is who he says he is, for anybody to deny God is God, okay, they are, they are literally saying, I do not believe anything that the Bible says. I just don't believe it. I don't believe any of, I don't believe fact, I don't believe truth. But they'll believe Abraham Lincoln, they'll believe in George Washington. Or they'll believe in Martin Luther King, even if they were just born recently. Yeah, they'll believe these things. They'll believe in Julius Caesar. Yeah, they'll believe in, in yeah, you're back in the like Caesar the same Augustine. time frame too. Yeah, yeah, yeah they'll believe in that. Yeah. They'll or, believe in Plato. They'll believe in Socrates. <laughs> Way but, before Christ. But they can't believe. They have there's more facts and more documentation yeah. from this period of time than any other time in the world. It's not even close. There, you cannot deny it. So. Anyway, so it's fake news, and I would not expect Satan not to try to minimize this grand event. That's a good point. Yep. We know that Jesus' death was voluntarily. We, we, he willingly dismissed his spirit. He gave himself as a ransom, as a sacrifice to God and the propitiation for our sin. So we must understand that, that when he said, Telestai, it is finished, the Bible is very clear what that means. That means that now if anybody believes in him, believes that he died on the cross and rose again, that he is the son of God and that he rose from the grave. The Bible is very clear that you can have eternal life and live with him for all eternity, that you no longer have to worry about the cares of this world and that Jesus will take away all of your sin, all of your guilt, all of your shame, and he will restore your life and bring peace and hope and joy into it. That's the truth. Can't deny it. That's the truth. And for us, Bob, our story says everything that I just said is true because I can testify it. Can you? Amen. And I've been changed. Have you? Yes. I have. My life is transformed for the better now. Has it yours? It has. So everything that the word says, we can testify that it's true. And we live it the best that we can in our imperfect state. We live it by God's grace and we can testify that we are changed. So for anybody to say that he did not say this or do this is a lie and it's fake news. All right. All right. Let's finish up the chapter. All right. Verse 31. Since it was the day of preparation and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a, was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken, that they may be taken away. They wanted them to die quicker, right? Yep. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it was born witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that mm. you also may mm. believe. Mm. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. Verse 38, after these things, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Jesus, uh, Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with spices as his burial custom of the Jews. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in that garden, a new tomb in which no one had been laid. 
So because of the G- because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. I can't wait to talk about Jer- Joseph of Arimathea. There's something. There's he's a secret agent. There's something. I mean, there's. Yeah. We, I can't wait to talk about it. So let's get he, let's he get is into a secret this. Agent. All right. So next statement: two groups of people were involved in Jesus's burial: the Roman soldiers and the Jewish believers. It was not unusual for victims to remain on the cross in a lingering death. Right. They just let them sit. I remember I was telling you about this. Cool. It's cool. There's roads of just people sitting there for a while. Yeah. But they would just break their legs and then they would die. But they would just let them linger. But here they're like, no, let's get them off fast. There's something because of the Passover, just yeah. all kinds of things that are happening. So that's kind of the context. They don't want them hanging up there right. for Passover? No. Nope. All right. So the Jewish leaders did all they could to hasten the death of Jesus and the two thieves. That's yep. what we talked about, breaking their legs. They just wanted to get it done. Let's get it over with. Let's get them off. You know, they're not going to linger here. You know, we're the ones in charge of crucifying this innocent man, you know, so it's going to be according to what we want. And so they're pushing for it. So that's kind of what's going on. But Jesus dismissed his spirit in the ninth hour. That was about 3 p.m. The last three words from the cross were spoken with a short period of time just before he laid down his life. What's remarkable to me is that the Roman soldiers did not do what they were commanded to do at first and break the victim's leg. They let it go on. So they usually like get up there and they break their legs and then it, 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 it makes it go a lot faster. They didn't do it yet, right? But what they did with Jesus is what they were not supposed to do. And they pierced his side and spear. So they looked at his way, he's already dead. So they pierced him to make sure. They, to make sure. So without them knowing it, they fulfilled the word of God. In Exodus 12, 46, Numbers 9, 12 says, the bones of the Passover lamb were not to be broken. Jesus' bones were protected by God. Then in Zechariah 12, 10, it says, his side was to be pierced. So that was done by the one of the soldiers. And then we know that also by the scriptures is that the, the soldier became a believer. So the minute that happens, it's like this blood and flowers, or whatever, he became a believer. His eyes were open. Holy cow. And it's, and it's the same thing with us. When we share God's truth with somebody, we have no idea what God's doing in that person's life. It might be the one word that you say and their eyes are open. And it could be just like this. It could be something that's said, something that's done, maybe an action, maybe how you handled something, maybe how you thought, maybe how you... You worked it out, whatever it is, that could be what God uses to open that person. Mm. In this moment, it was the blood and water that flowed. It opened his eyes. He saw the truth. So that's why we want to say, God, today I choose to be obedient. Today I choose to live for you. Today I choose to surrender and and bring you glory in all that I do because I have no idea what you're going to do today. I don't have any idea what circumstance, whatever you're going to put me in, that could help somebody come to know who you are. Or no. All right. John saw a special significance to the blood and water that came from the wound in Jesus' side. For one thing, it proved that Jesus had a real body and experienced a real death. Yeah, again, these are little things that we take for granted. We just blow it over, right? We don't need, oh, what is, what is? No, listen, he was fully human and fully God, okay? He lived out everything that we live in the human form. He, you know, when Paul says, I no longer live, but Christ that lives within me, he was fully engulfed with the Holy Spirit. And he had no hindrance from having oneness with the Father because he was living a holy, perfect life, right? He was still reliant on the Father, but he had all power, all authority, all understanding. Jesus knew things before other things. I have, I have had the Spirit of God share with me certain things that I knew before other people. I've had that happen where I would speak something to somebody or do something. And then all of a sudden it would come true or whatever that is that I spoke, it would be true. That's what Jesus had. He had that, but there's a lot of things that we don't have is because we're hindered because of our sin. We're hindered from walking intimately in certain areas of our life because we're, we, we don't, and we don't have access to that. Jesus had all the gifts, all the talents, everything because God entrusted him with it. God proved, Jesus proved himself as worthy lamb, a worthy sacrifice. And so that is kind of what it is. But by the time John wrote his book, 90 AD ish, um, there were false teachers in the church claiming that Jesus did not have a truly human body. There may be some, uh, be a symbolic meeting. The blood speaks of the, our justification, the water of our sanctification and the cleansing 
but the blood takes care of the guilt of sin. The water deals with the stain of sin. We know that 1 John 5, 6, it deals with the evidence that Jesus is God. He came in the flesh and he presents three witnesses, the spirit, the water, and the blood. So with that said, the spirit relates to the Pentecost, the water to the baptism, and the blood to the crucifixion. The bottom line in, in each of these events is God made it clear that Jesus is what he claimed to be. God came in in the flesh period. That's it. We know that. God came in the flesh. We cannot deny it. Everybody can say what they want to say. We know that by scripture, by truth, and by the context of what we got. That's the truth. All right. That's awesome. Okay. I won't keep, I won't make you wait any longer. Let's turn our attention to Joseph yes. of Arimathea and yes. Nicodemus. Yes. Why did Joseph have a tomb so near to the place of execution? I would guess most people would not want to be buried there, but in the holy city. He was a rich man. He could have certainly afforded a better resting place. So he's already bought his plot, right? Think about Why it. Next to where they're doing executions. Think about it. I mean, come on, let's put on our common sense brain here. Here's this, here's this rich man. He says he was in secret, right? He's a secret agent. This man already knew people. He already had this all planned. I mean, think about it. Nicodemus had all the, all the senses and everything. You know, this is a very short period of time. Okay, this is all happening. They have to do this in a very quick order. You know, the Passover is coming on. He's got to die. He's got to do this. Ah, da, 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 da. Yeah, normally they'd be, they'd be preparing for the Passover. Come on. Not preparing for a burial. Who buys, who, what rich man buys a burial plot right there by the crucifixion? I mean, you're going to go in the plosh pot. You're going to go in the areas where all the other rich people go or whatever. I don't know. I don't want to read into it. <laughs> but, but you kind of are. <laughs> but come on. That's what I'm saying. Let's put on our common sense here. There's yeah. something deeper here and it just seems, okay, whatever. But Matthew, Luke, and John all say that the tomb was new and had never been used. It was Joseph's own new tomb. He had hewed it for himself or did he? Did he hit it, hew it for Jesus? I don't know. But John informs us that Joseph was a secret disciple for the fear of the Jews. So Joseph was God's secret agent. From right, a human standpoint, Joseph kept undercover because he feared the Jews, but from the divine standpoint, he was being protected so he could be available to bury the body of Christ. Same goes with Nicodemus, with bringing the spices and the wrappings. It's almost like they were commissioned by God for the great work. It's like they knew ahead of time what was coming on. That's my take on it. So when you read this and how quickly all of this had to take place, I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. You know, let's let our brains go a little bit. Does it take away from it? No. But could God have raised up secret agents? I believe he could have. Does God put people in places for such a time as this? Sure. I believe he does. Well, even if they didn't know what was going to happen, they could have just been being obedient to God. And they God, had no idea what it was going to be. Right. Yeah. So there's that possibility yep. too, that God told them to do this yep. and they were just obedient, yep. not, not knowing. Yep. Right. And it's like, maybe he was like, I have no idea why that's I bought that more, plot of land. That's almost yeah. more impressive. Yeah, it's probably true. <laughs> He's like, he might have said, well, I don't know why I had all these spices and everything at the house, but I'm going to use it now. Or, yeah, I just bought like four different plots of land. I wasn't sure which one I want to go in. Uh, but yeah, but God just God's revealed telling them, me boom. to do this. Yeah. And it needed to be close. You got to remember that. It couldn't be far away. They needed to get the bury the body in quickly. That, that's the Before whole big Sunday. point. That's it. That's it. So. Three o'clock in the afternoon. Yep. We know that it is. So, all right. Well, if you're listening to this, I mean, this was a great show. This was fun. We had a lot of fun. We laughed, but we talked again about a major, serious, important topic, and that was the death of Jesus. And, um, you know, you're listening to this and you're just like, okay, I heard what you were saying that, you know, there's no doubt that everything that the Bible is saying is true. Um, we talked about Jesus coming as God in the flesh. We know he lived a life. He and we know the thief on the cross was there. We can believe that. We know that he, he just said that if he just confessed that Jesus was God, that Jesus looked at him and says, okay, today you're going to be with me in paradise. And so this is all what the Bible says. This is all true. And so then Jesus is now looking at you, listener, and he's saying to you, listen, if you believe in me, if you believe in everything that I did, you live uh, that I lived this perfect holy life and I did and I sacrificed so that you can have eternal life with me for all eternity. If you just believe that, then I like the thief on the cross, you can be with him for all eternity. 
if you were to die today, if you were to die tomorrow, you can know for sure, just like that thief knew, that you will be with him in paradise for the rest of your life. It's, it's a guarantee. It's a fact. We've already, we've talked about on this show many times before that, that uh, the, the, the archaeological findings and the, and the manuscripts and, and all of these facts and these proofs and truths showing that everything that the Bible says is true. They, they've tried to dissect this Bible every which way you could possibly do. And every time they try to dissect it, they find an archaeological finding of where they said the Bible said it was, or they'll find a, some sort of something about Pilate or David or this or whatever. It's always been found true. You cannot deny it. It's in fact, the, the Smithsonian Institute says that they use the Bible exclusively for archaeological digs or trying to find places because they know that every time they open it up and they try to look, they find something. So if that is all the case, then, and you do not believe in Jesus, then you're making a radical choice against your life, uh, eternal life. And you're making a radical choice because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And, and if you are not a child of God, that means the Bible says that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess before the Lord. And one day you will have to give an account of what you're hearing right now. One day you will have to tell God directly that you willfully chose not to believe the truth of the Bible and that you rejected him. And then what Jesus will say to you is he will say, depart from me for I have never known you. And that departure means that you will then be in hell for all eternity. That is unbelievable. What is the worst that can happen to you if you give your life to Jesus? You live a life that's filled with joy. You live a life of goodness. You live a life of peace. You live a life of, of doing what's right by people. I mean, what? how hard is that? How bad is that? And here's the bottom line is if you believe in Jesus, the Bible says that you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Bible says that old things in your life will pass away and behold, all things will be made new. You will be a new creation of Christ. It will be completely different. You will have peace that you've never had before. You would have joy that you can't comprehend. Things will be changed if you surrender your life to the Lord. Now listen, I'm telling you, 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 just take my word for it. Believe what I'm saying and give your life to Jesus. If you want to do that, just say, God, forgive me of my sins. Just pray right now. Lord, come into my life as my Lord and personal Savior. I repent of my sins and I accept you as my, as my God. I believe that you died and rose again on the third day. And I believe that by believing in you and living and surrender my life to you, I will have eternal life with you for all. And, and that's it. And Jesus says now that all the, all the angels in heaven are rejoicing. They're having a party because you gave your life to the Lord. And they're also saying that, that, that the Bible also says that now you need to confess him because if you don't, the Father and Jesus says, I will, not, I will deny you in heaven. But if you confess him before man on earth, he will confess you before the Father in heaven. So go confess him. Go share this truth with somebody else. And we would love to hear from you. So, Bob, how could, we, how could they get in touch with us? Great, Pete. That's awesome. The best way to get in touch, touch with us, just go to our website, theriotpodcast.com. Um, click on the No God tab, and that will answer a bunch of questions. But if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, there's a kind of a contact page. You can reach out to us if you have any questions. Happy to answer them for you. If you're looking for, I, I don't know, the, the, a Bible believing church in your area, we'd be happy to help you find one of those as well. And then we also have tons of resources on social media. You can go to Twitter. Pete loves Twitter. That's his favorite place. You can go to Facebook. Um, you know what? Do us a favor. Go to YouTube, click, even if you're listening to the show on the podcast, would you go to YouTube, click the subscribe button, click a like of the latest app episode, and just let us know where you're listening to us from. We would love to hear from you. So I pray that this show was special for you. I, I hope it'll kind of open your eyes a little bit more to the what happened, the crucifixion. And uh, we're getting close, Pete. We're coming to the most important yes. thing in the Bible. Yes. The resurrection. Yeah, Without right. the resurrection, none of this other stuff matters. Yep. So uh, we're almost there. All right. Well, be blessed, guys. Looking forward to hearing from you. This has been The Riot Podcast. If you liked what you heard today, please feel free to leave a comment and share it with your friends. See you back here next week for another episode of The Riot Podcast.